Hey, welcome back to Harness Your Intuitive Superpowers, where you learn energy secrets that busy professionals need in order to thrive beyond mediocrity and embody extraordinary success and abundance. I'm your host, Dr. Amir Hall, and today I'm so excited to bring to you Tiffany Toombs. Tiffany is known as an international speaker and a leading expert in rewiring the unconscious mind so that you can access greater success and tap into your infinite potential. For over 20 years now, Tiffany has been educating and transforming the lives of people around the globe. She's the author of Stop Being a Selfish Bitch, which is a comprehensive guide to living your best life, learning through radical self-love. And she's the host of a top-ranked podcast called Motherhood Unfiltered. I think you're going to love this interview. So let's welcome Tiffany Toombs. So welcome, welcome, Tiffany. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it's. It, I think we've got so much to explore and discuss. I forgot to mention that you're a relatively new mom of a 13-month little baby boy. Yes, he keeps me busy, but reminds me of, you know, every day of why this work that we're doing is so important. Well, you've been on your path now for 20 years. So can you tell me what is it that got you into this work? Yeah, so for me, ultimately as a healer was my traumatic past. So my mom left my biological dad when I was three months old. He stalked her, broke into our house three times, held a knife to her throat when I was sleeping in the crib right next to her bed. And eventually he met a woman when I was about three years old. He met a woman who was a domestic violence survivor herself. She was actually living in a woman's shelter at the time that he met her. And this is back like before cell phones. He would pick me up for my weekends with him. And then he would pull up in front of this woman's shelter, which he was not allowed to go in. And he would send me in as this three-year-old. And so I remember one of my first thoughts that I can actually remember was that being a woman was a weakness. And so for so much of my life, my intuitive superpowers, as we're talking about today, and anything feminine, I just really repelled and rejected. And I started fitness coaching at the age of 14 because I was so uncomfortable in my skin that I felt like if I could help other people have confidence or feel good in their skin by being fit and being healthy and re rehabbing their injuries, that I would feel better at, at some sort of extension of that. And so that's where I started when I was 14. I was literally like checking books out of the library on summer vacation, learning how to tape an ankle and things like that while everybody else was wow. out and doing whatever. Things came to a head for me about 10 years ago. I was living in Australia. I had a boyfriend for three years. And on the day I found out I was pregnant, I found out he had a girlfriend in another stage. And my entire life crumbled. I ended up miscarrying the baby. And it just, it became a point where I knew that if I didn't actually start healing, like I couldn't heal myself by healing other people. I actually had to do the inner work myself. And that if I didn't do that, I probably wasn't going to survive much longer because this, that point, that incident that happened 10 years ago, literally brought me to the point of considering suicide and ending it all. I went on my own personal journey as I was continuing in the fitness industry. And I realized in the fitness industry, I pretty much was a healer and a mindset coach. And so I moved fully into that space. And the more that I've healed, the more that I've been able to step into my own intuitive superpowers that have always been there and have guided me. They guided me to Australia and they guided me in other areas of my life. But now it's about living that every day. Yeah, I love that. And you mentioned something. You shut down the feminine parts of you. And I know that intuition is typically known as that feminine aspect but it's a part of men and women. It's not just women shutting down that feminine part. It's men can shut that creative, nurturing inner voice as well. Yes, it's yeah. a feminine aspect, but a lot of people might listening might not understand the nuances of, let's say, feminine and masculine energy that we each have within us. Yeah, right? I was going to say, we all have a different balance. It's about figuring right. what right. our unique signature is in that space. But for me, I felt safer shutting that piece of me down to move into my total masculine, which just led to burnout and not a very happy life. 
Yeah. When we talk about masculine energy, we're talking about the doer pushing, driving harder, pushing and making decisions maybe that by with our head instead of our heart. What else would you say that would be signs that you're using your masculine self versus your feminine self? I feel like the wounded masculine, which is really what I was in and really what I see a lot of specifically women who are in this like ultra independent, it's the can't ask for help, don't know how to receive a compliment. Like it's that polar opposite side of I always have to be doing something. The hustle and grind culture is really the wounded masculine. Yes. That our value comes from. And our worthiness comes from how many hours of productivity we're doing, whereas the feminine is about balancing out the masculine is going to take some action and then the feminine can receive the gifts and the compensation for the actions that the masculine takes. But it's also the rest and the rejuvenation. So it's finding our own unique balance so that we're not and and then healing both sides of them as well. So we're not in a wounded place in either of those. Right. I know myself, I came from a corporate world and as an achiever, super achiever, a type A personality, it wasn't until I got burnout. And even then, even when I was warned, like, hey, if you keep going on this path, you are just going to burn out. And hey, I was intellectually driven. I was driven in every department, but my body could only take so much. And that's when I had to learn that nuance of listening to that inner self and cultivating that inner self and listening to the signs that I overrode a lot of times and dismissed, oh, that's a dumb idea. I can't just sit on the sofa and ohm. Or it wasn't, mind you, those days where it was way before meditation was cool. But it's so much we just were so busy in the action that we miss those intuitive nudges. We miss those little nuances that could make the whatever we're trying to achieve so much easier, so much yeah. more fluid. Yeah. And for me, it was really like a sense of shame. Like when I was like, oh, I'm tired. It was like, stop being lazy. Yeah. Like I would judge and criticize and shame myself back into taking action. So then I would literally feel guilty taking time off. When we had my son, I was like, I really want family time. And I remember so many times throughout like my teenage years and my 20s and even into my 30s, I was like, what do people do on the weekend if they're not working? I just, I don't know what to do if I'm not working. What do you mean hobbies and fun? Like, yeah, I'll do that after at night when I have a couple drinks and let off some steam. And think as well, for me, in my wounded masculine, I had a lot of unhealthy coping mechanisms as well, such as drinking and party. Yeah, that can take us down a spiral out of control. And we think it's helping us relax. and. The trick is, I know I can have a glass of wine every now and again, and I'm okay, but I can remember times where I spent my 20s trying to drink Canada Dry, hint, hint. It was, was, those are the days of you have a drink to get to the party type of thing. But the next day you're wiped out. You don't have a sense of what you want to do because you're just flat. You're just so thick with, we know it's unconscious energy, but it's unclear distractions. And then you're just, shoveling pain pills because you're right yeah Yeah. absolutely that was really my early life up until I had the miscarriage and this infidelity that I was like I have to make a change like I cannot keep living my life like this because it's cloudy it's fuzzy and it's really not directed towards what you want you are probably making choices and decisions for an us and hopefully an us and it wasn't all for you, loving you. Yeah. And it was all my decisions also were all about like, how can I feel good right now? It doesn't matter how I feel tomorrow. Like when tomorrow comes, I'll figure that out. But it was very much instant gratification. How can I let go of all this pain that I feel now? And if I'm being totally honest, the reason that I stayed in that relationship, even though deep down I knew it was unconscious, right? My or it was toxic. But that intuitive sense was telling me, like, is this really? Like the one, but I was like, no, it's good. It's better than being alone and shutting down that intuitive side. You can only shut it down for so long before the universe or whatever is going to intervene and be like, sometimes we need the hard lesson to uh, to get us back on track. And divorce, we're anticipating more pain. If we're all str- already struggling in our own trauma and pain, and then we've got to focus or, or consider 
a divorce. I remember myself, I went through divorce and I remember before I got divorced, I was thinking, I did some personal development training and I got the message that I was living in a prison cell and that my marriage were like bars around me. And I was new in America. I had no family and no support system. And it was petrifying for me. I went to counseling and I talked about it and talked about it and talked about it. My big fear of being alone, right? So I'm sure my nervous system was just cranked up. But when I finally did take the step, I realized it was the best thing I could have done for myself. And yes, it was painful. It wasn't an easy, even though we agreed to it. My ex-husband wrote me a letter a year and a half later saying, thank you for having the courage. And even though I couldn't see where I was going and I had no resources, I was trusting my intuition because I would die if I stayed in that relationship. And yeah. so I think it was so strong within me that just couldn't do anything but that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, this impacts our all these indecisions or a lack of decision or lack of courage or even having healthy boundaries. That's impacting our nervous system, right? Which ultimately affects our intuition. Yeah. Need to talk about that? Yeah. Our nervous system is really a roadmap of where we've been. It's a collection of all the things that have ever happened to us. And specifically, unfortunately, the way that it works is that we hold on more so to the negative unresolved things than the moments of like joy and happiness. We can tap into those emotions, but for most people, our nervous system becomes a reflection of all the moments where we felt a fear of abandonment or that we would be rejected, humiliated, betrayed, or things weren't fair. Like those are the five core childhood wounds. And they leave these quote unquote marks on the nervous system. And, and this starts like literally from the moment we're conceived. And we even know now through epigenetics that it can be passed down to us, through us, through our DNA, right? So we're carrying all of this stuff and the bag becomes heavier and heavier as we go throughout life. And then we wonder why we're so easily triggered. We wonder why we're so emotional or where we feel like our emotions hijack us. And this is really where addiction comes in is that people are looking for a coping mechanism because they've never learned how to release from their nervous system. So they're looking for that coping mechanism. But all of this is just piling on top of the intuition and people become so disconnected from themselves as a way of not having to feel that pain that they disconnect from their intuition in the process as well. One of the most common things that I hear from people when we start their healing process, when we start the nervous system journey, is they don't even know the difference between their intuition or gut feeling and like fear or shame. These other things, they're like, no, but my body, my intuition is telling me that I'm an idiot right now. And I'm like, that's not your intuition, right? Anything that causes you to like contract and shrink in or feel these feelings of shame and judgment, that's not intuition. Intuition is expansive and it's coming from a place of love. Even if it says like it, yours did to you, you need to find the courage to leave this marriage. That's a loving sense instead of, oh, you're an idiot if you leave or you're an idiot if you stay. That's the fear speaking. And so what happens is our nervous system goes into survival mode and that further disassociates us from our intuition because when you're in survival mode, it's like the bear is chasing you 24-7. And so that's not a time to sit and be creative. It's not a time to be innovative. It's not a time to sit and be still, right? You're either running from the bear or you're preparing to fight it. And so you're all of your body's resources, all of your energy goes towards how can I survive this next moment? And your brain and your nervous system starts to try and predict what's going to happen next. But what it's predicting is all the worst possible things that could happen. And these are where our intrusive thoughts come in. And then people will think that's their intuition. Oh, but my intuition is telling me I shouldn't start this business because of the economy. Oh, my intuition is telling me I shouldn't do this thing but they don't realize that's the contraction of the survival mode and the fear system of the brain, the amygdala, not actually their intuition. And so what I found is when we start healing the nervous system with people, they start to come out of survival mode and then we can reconnect them to their body, to their intuition. And then, then they see the difference like, oh, it's not this like doom and gloom. 
I have to be prepared to run or fight all the time. It's actually like this loving, hey, let's nudge us in this direction or let's look at this thing that maybe isn't serving us anymore and just release it. There's no shame or judgment attached to it. Yeah, I like to just say it's just energy. And even though there are emotions, but it is energy. And when mm-hmm. we can get so neutral with it, then there's, there is no shame on it. There is no judgment. Yeah. 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 So let's say besides running from the bear, can you give us some other examples that people are in survival mode? Yeah. So the most common kind of symptoms that you're in survival mode are what I like to call stress addiction, because what happens at a cellular level in the body is that your body cells start to crave cortisol, which is our stress hormone. So if you're not hungry first thing in the morning, there's so many people who are like, I'm just not a breakfast person. That's actually a sign that your body is pumping out cortisol. And that's why you don't feel hungry. Because again, bears chasing you, not the time to sit down and eat some bacon and eggs. If you need coffee to have energy, not you like to have a cup of coffee, but like you physically need it to have energy. If you're waking up in the middle of the night, trouble sleeping, insomnia, if you're getting the cold sweats, that's another sign that your body is pumping out cortisol and adrenaline. It's the adrenaline causing the cold sweats. If you feel tired all the time, except after a workout, you feel energized after a workout, but then after an hour, you go back into that slump. And that's another sign that you're in this stress addiction, survival mode phase. And then the other one is cold hands and feet, because what survival mode does is it shuts down our metabolism. So then it, we put on weight or we store weight. We have an inability to lose weight. We're cold all the time because our body's furnace isn't working properly. And so it's like we're using this gas power generator from outside to fuel us. You might feel the brain fog as well. That's another common sign, which then makes it even harder to differentiate between fear and emotions and emotional triggers and your intuition. Wow, that's incredible. I never perceived it that way. So how... Do you work with people in identifying these aspects? In identifying if their nervous system's in survival mode? Yeah. So we'll look at different aspects of their life. If people come to me and they're stuck somewhere in their life, right? People will be stuck in money. I keep coming back to the same pattern. I keep making more money, but then spending it when I don't really need to, or I keep hoarding it or whatever it is, right? If you're creating uh, from an unconscious level, nobody does this consciously or very few people do. But if from an unconscious level, you keep ending up back in that same situation, you keep having this chaos and drama in your life, it's likely because your nervous system needs more situations to survive or your body will literally hijack your mind to create chaos, either through your thoughts or through your actions, because it needs that hit of cortisol. And so what we have to start doing is first recognize the pattern right? We talk about stress hormones, but that doesn't always create the feeling of stress for everybody. It could be anxious, it could be overwhelmed, it could be confused or angry, or you go into this paralysis state or brain fog. So we have to figure out what your pattern is or what your memorized state of being is. When I started to heal, I also was somebody who had a lot of burnout after that miscarriage. And so when I started to heal that, I did go into a period where we need more rest, which is normal. We're basically in an energy debt and our body will require more rest, but it's like I never came out of it. And so fatigue, just telling myself I was tired all the time, became my default mode to stop myself from moving forward. And so I thought I was healing, but I was actually just create, I was procrastinating essentially by being like, oh, I'm so tired. I need a nap right now. And I could never get anything done. It's another energy block, basically. Yeah. And so we first have to figure out like, what is the pattern? What is the emotional state that you go back to? If you think of having an emotional thermostat that's set to a specific emotion, where do you most commonly go? And you can, the easiest way to tell this is your thoughts and your emotions first thing in the morning, right? You wake up, You start thinking about all your problems or your to-do list for the day or whatever. What's the emotion that you go back into? Dread, stress, anxiety, whatever it is. And then during moments when life is throwing you a curveball, again, where do you go into? 
What are the emotions that you go into? That's your memorized state of being, which basically means you've fired off that circuit in your brain so many times that it's become a reflex and your body doesn't even have to think about it anymore. Just you don't even need a problem to be happening. You just go into it. You could be watching a movie and go back into this motion. And so we start there and then we have to start to do some exercises to strengthen the vagus nerve, which is the nerve in the body that moves us from the fight or flight sympathetic nervous system into the parasympathetic, right? It's If I go to the gym and I haven't been going for a while, I lift up 10 pounds for a bicep curl. It's probably going to be pretty heavy. But if I keep going, it's going to, I'm going to become stronger and I'm going to be able to do that movement faster. But if I stop going to the gym, I'm going to lose that muscle tone. And the same thing happens with our vagus nerve. It's almost like our vagus nerve gets stuck in stress mode and like a gear in your car, you just can't get out of that gear. We have to strengthen it. So that's part of the nervous system healing. And then the second part is about creating a sense of safety in the body, like just letting our body know we're safe. We don't have to be on high alert right now. It's okay to just relax and it's okay to just sit in stillness without wondering like what the next possible negative thing is going to be, what could possibly harm us in this moment. And so those are the three main aspects of healing the nervous system that I work on with people. How do we break the cycle? So many people were just so preoccupied with our devices and workaholics that we don't know how to break the stress cycle. Yeah. So it does, the thing that I get all of my clients to do to start, because I know they're likely going to always have their phones on them, is to set an alarm. Set at least three ideally five or six alarms randomly to go off throughout the day. It doesn't have to make a lot of noise. It can just be something pops up on your screen, but it says check in. And in that moment, you check in with yourself. You take a moment to be like, okay, what am I thinking right now? What am I feeling right now? And then we start to like question like, okay, what meaning am I giving to this emotion? I'm feeling overwhelmed. What meaning am I giving to that? Because nothing has the has meaning except what we give it. And so Two people could have the exact same to-do list and one person be completely overwhelmed and in paralysis over it. And the other person just starts prioritizing and working through it. And this is really a sense of where our nervous system is at. And so the higher we go in our stress levels, the more paralyzed we become. So just checking in. Okay, so I have a lot of things on my to-do list and I'm feeling overwhelmed by that. And I'm telling myself that I'm not good enough or that there's too much or this can't be done or I'm tired. Check in with those thoughts. Like what is the meaning that I'm giving to this situation? And then check in and just ask, okay, how do I know this is true? Is it absolutely true right now that if I don't finish everything on this to-do list that I'm a failure or that I'm not good enough or whatever it is that you're telling yourself? So that's the first thing I like to get people to do. The second thing is conscious breathing. So taking five or 10 minutes first thing in the morning and last thing at night and either counting breaths. So four counts in, five counts in, four or five counts out, whatever it is. Or new neuroscience research shows that a breathing technique called the physiological sigh is actually more beneficial. Five minutes of that a day is more beneficial than five minutes of meditation. And what it is taking a deep breath and then you pause and you take another sip of air and then fully exhale through the mouth. So it looks like pause and just doing that for five minutes. My son will be running around playing and I'll sit and do that in the morning, right? One of the first things that I heard when I got pregnant was, you're not going to be able to do this and you're not, your me time and your meditation and your yoga, that's all gone, no more traveling. And that's not been the case. In the first 13 months, all the things that we were told couldn't do, we have done with him. And so he'll be running around playing. Celebrate you. That's amazing. Healer, heal thyself and we've got to walk the talk. Absolutely. And he's he was doing downward dogs before he even started walking because <laughs> he saw me doing them every morning. But he'll be running around playing and I'll just set an alarm for a timer for 10 minutes and I'll do my deep breathing while I watch him play. That's all. Awesome. And so getting them to just regularly check in with their breath. 
setting alarms for once every hour, once every couple hours to remind them to do two minutes of conscious breathing throughout the day. That's going to relax the body as well. Like our nervous system and our breath are so interconnected that when we take deep breaths, which we wouldn't do if a bear was chasing us, we remind the body, oh, I'm safe in this moment. And we can create pockets of time where we turn off the fight or flight. And that allows us to create a whole new default emotional state. Yeah, healing. Yes. And listening to the intuition, all of a sudden we might hear some little voice that was foreign to us. Yeah. When you said you were doing downward dogs or with your son so early in life, you in our earlier conversation before we started recording, you mentioned that you do horse yoga. Yes. And I was flabbergasted with that. Can you tell us how in the heck do you do? Is the horse moving or stationary? And is this how did you get into horse yoga? So it started during my healing journey. One of the coaches that I worked with, we did some horse meditation and I was teaching meditation classes at a yoga studio that got bought out by another yoga studio. And that woman did horse yoga. And so she would invite me along and she would get me to do some meditation with the horses as well. And we collaborated on that. But it's you're basically barefoot and bareback. The horse is stationary. You usually work with a partner. So you have somebody holding the horse but the horse goes into a meditative state as well. The beautiful thing about it is you're on this animal that's a couple tons, right? And can shift weight at any moment. Maybe they're stomping out a fly or they're doing whatever. And so- The tail comes around. <laughs> yeah. And unlike in normal meditation where your mind can float off and then come back and float off, you really become connected to this horse where you breathe, you imagine breathing with the horse and then you go into different poses from, I'll send you a picture, but I did this downward dog on top of this like six foot tall horse and my pure, my purified's really kicked in that moment. But wow. you do a seated forward fold and it's giving the horse a massage as well. Not, you have to have a fairly gentle horse to do this with. If they're super crazy, then it's not going to work, but they go into a meditative state. They get the benefit of that massage as you move through the different poses and you get you're not going super deep into a ton of poses, but you're getting the connection. You're getting the mindfulness piece that yoga is so much about. And I, I love doing it and I love taking people through the process because it is just you have to be so aligned and totally present in that moment because if the horse moves and you're not, you want to talk about tapping into your intuition, you become so connected to this animal that you know when they're about to shift. You can feel the muscle movements, the micro muscle movements before they actually move so that you can stabilize yourself and they can stomp or they can do whatever they need to shift weight. And then you can come back into your movement. I think it's an incredible experience and talk about coming into alignment and listening and tuning all of your superpowers. It's not just your inside voice. It's probably a sense of feeling and knowingness and that connection with you. And I see a bigger sense or a greater sense of bigger because the horse is bigger, but it's a grounding. A horse is grounded, truly a powerful amplifer to help. And horse, connect. Horses are used in so much healing work. They're used in yeah. problem kids, vets with PTSD, other people with PTSD, because they're so intuitive. And so right. horses have a tendency to mirror back to us what's underneath the surface. And that was what was so powerful in my healing journey was one of the horses that I did a meditation with was the alpha female of the herd. And this was back when I was still like super uncomfortable in my feminine. And so I was like, of course, I get the most the alpha female, right? <laughs> like, of course, that's the horse. And you know, it was just like, <laughs> oh, horse, of course. <laughs> yeah. All these messages coming through as I'm watching the, her like gallop through the field with this blonde mane flowing and like these purple flowers in the background. She's so beautiful. This is not me. And oh, that's an interesting judgment. And just the whole thing was so powerful and that she reflected back to me so many of the ways that I was resenting and rejecting my feminine. And then when I let go of that and I apologized to my feminine and I really was like, I want to fix this relationship. She came up to me and she put her snout right on my heart oh. and just breathed into me. And it was like this just beautiful experience. And it was like, 
just me being in that space of receiving her love because I had made that commitment to healing this relationship with my feminine. And so that's why horses are so powerful for this work is because they are such an intuitive animal. It's that's amazing. Very powerful. Yeah. I know we, we didn't get off our topic in terms of intu intuitive superpowers. I think in this case, the horse was right amplifying you and just really got your message. No fooling yeah. around, right? Yeah, absolutely. Have you done any other kind of journeys or experiences developing your intuition? So I've done a lot of my inner work. I find the more that I do my inner work, inner child work, shadow work, mirror work, even my ayahuasca journey really brought up my intuitive abilities. My husband, when I first met him, was like your typical Southern American boy. Voices in your head means you're crazy kind of yeah. thing. As he, he first thought I was a witch. But we, as we spent more time together and he started to heal, he came to me one day and he was like, I think I might be crazy because I hear these voices in my head like telling me I need to do this thing. And the times that I follow them, like my business goes so much better or our relationship gets even better. And he's like, but I think I'm crazy. And I was like, oh, that's your intuition. And he realized just how intuitive he is, but he had been suppressing it for so long. So I think that inner healing work, releasing the trauma, releasing the emotional baggage really allows us to come back to who we truly are, which then unlocks those intuitive superpowers. Absolutely. So I lived in Dubai for five years. And I was doing my work there. And one thing that shocked me, I was quite alarmed by this, is how incredibly intuitive that the Arabs, the local population were. And I would say the same would be true with the Indian culture. They were picking up telepathically messages. If I was in a conversation, they'd say things. And every single client would come to me and talk about their prophetic dreams. And it was shocking. To me, the only thing I can attribute it to is one, they don't work all the time, like us. They pray five times a day. So even if they're not into, we can get into our prayers and not be wholeheartedly into it. It's like we're just, at least I was when I was practicing Catholic. It's like you would just get into the prayer and you just continue to repeat it. And it didn't really resonate. And uh, But even if they're not in that state, they're mindful of that time. And a lot of their daily life, the expression is, Alhamdulillah, thank you to God. So there's a constant reminder of thanking to God and to being in this divine connection. I found it astounding that especially the men, I found the Arab men were far more intuitive than my experience had been with Amer America, let's say Western men. Yeah, yeah, it was interesting. And they don't recognize it or talk about it like you and I would be. And yes. it's fascinating. Like the Bedouins, the desert dwellers, they would just have to follow nature. And I think all of our ancestors were probably far more intuitive than we are. Yeah, I, I think the more distractions or the more kind of comfort objects that we have, the more it enables us to become disconnected from ourselves and disconnected from nature. Yeah. We go outside and we put on shoes that blocks us from that energy flow of the earth. We spend time, more time with devices than we do out in nature that speeds us up. Like we know that yeah. the, the pineal gland, the third eye really moves at about seven hertz, but our tech speeds us up and we're surrounded by it. And we're not spending a lot of time in nature, or if we are, we still have tech with us. And we're literally so, amped up. <laughs> yeah, we really are. And so that the more that happens, and then, you know, the chemicals in our food and in our hygiene products and our cleaning products, there's just so much that calcifies and mineralizes the pineal gland and disconnects us from who we are at a natural state. And I think there's really been this awakening in the last couple of years where people are like, I need to get back to where I was. I've never seen so many people talk about, maybe I should just sell everything and figure out how to homestead or like, I need to start a garden or something. I think in the last three years, yeah. there's really been that awakening, which is- We had that big break called COVID. Yeah. That got our head thinking in different directions, but hey, I've sold everything that I own three times now. Yeah. And, yeah. And yeah, it does take courage. And talk about trusting your intuition. Whether you're leaving a relationship or a long-time career, 
or changing your residence and moving out of state. So many people I know have moved across states. Yeah. Yeah. Even us. I, so I moved, I've been to Australia from Canada, then to Texas with my husband. And we were like, when we had our son, we were like, we don't want to raise him in the city. Let's go to Tennessee. <laughs> we oh, just, what, where were you in Texas? We were in the DFW area. Okay. Yeah. So what would you say to somebody that is sensing they've got some intuitive hits, but they don't trust it? That's a good question. I think the nervous system work will really help you be able to differentiate between the fear voice and the intuitive voice. And I think for people who really lack, while you're building up this feeling of safety and trust in yourself and in your intuition again, you can always ask your intuition like, okay, selling everything I own and moving across country or maybe even to a different country, pretty big move. Not sure if I trust that yet. Can we start with some like smaller pieces? Can you give me a smaller nudge to follow so that I can build that trust up, right? Like the way we build trust in ourselves is by making a small promise to ourselves and keeping it every single day so we can see our own consistency. We can do the same thing in building our trust up with our intuition is to say, hey, nervous system has been in survival mode. So while we heal that, can you give me a small nudge like a person to call? or a book to read or something like that's really going to show me where I need to go next so that I feel comfortable taking this massive step that right. you know to that point Tiffany I think there's a lot of times where we don't know the next one and you have to sit and be quiet and ask for signs until you get that definitive answer to yeah. uh, take a step I mean, that's been my experience so sometimes yeah. I know just like that and other times when I just don't like to move to Texas. I probably sat on it for two years. I didn't know where I was moving. I knew I was going to be moving, but didn't know where and it wasn't time yet. Yeah. And I've done the, okay, I know that you're asking me to do this really big thing and that feels really uncomfortable. And I'm just, I'm not a hundred percent sure yet that I should raise the rates in my business or that I should make this move or that I should ask for this opportunity. Can we start with something smaller? Like just give me something smaller to build that momentum up so that I can take this bigger step and your intuition will work with you on it. Yeah, I love that. This has just been so incredibly enriching. I'm so grateful for all that. Now, I know that you have a special gift that you want to share with our listeners. Yes, so it is my seven-day nervous system reset. These are the seven most powerful exercises that I have personally used and that I give to every single one of my personal clients to help heal the nervous system. So a couple of the exercises are a daily routine. They'll take you less than 10 minutes a day to do them, but they have a super powerful, powerful effect almost immediately. Consistency obviously is important, but you'll start feeling shifts immediately. And then some of the exercises are in there for when the emotions overwhelming you in the moment and you feel yourself going into overwhelm or anxiety or panic, come back to those exercises and they'll help you get some space from the triggering emotions so that you can actually listen to your intuition and figure out where to go next. That's awesome. And so I want you to get Tiffany's gift because when you're overwhelmed, you're going to need this at your fingertips, right? We want yes. to have it accessible. Not yeah. that we're going to think about it when we're panicking or stressed out because most likely you are. Yeah. yeah. So thank you so much. I just wanted to ask you one last thing. If you had anything to say to somebody here right now, what would you do different looking back? Would there be any changes that you would do or make in your life? I do aim to live my life with no regrets. So I would say, knowing what I know now, the only thing I would do different is I would stop and look at the lessons that the challenging situations were coming to teach me sooner. I would have connected to that intuition, see what was I supposed to learn with this so that I didn't have to repeat the same issue multiple times to find that. Right. Yeah. If you're like me, a lot of people, we're stubborn. We're just darn yeah. stubborn and we're not trusting that little nudge. And if we could only just, we could gracefully move through some of these life challenges if we just listened to our intuition and trusted Absolutely. it. Or getting some support to yes. help us and show us the way. Yeah, definitely. Hey, I just think you're amazing. I am so impressed with your horse yoga. 
and all of the teachings and wisdoms that you shared with us. I'm so grateful that you joined us and to have that gift to share with us. Thanks Thank you. For I'm super grateful to be here and it's been an amazing conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Please go ahead and click for Tiffany's gift. Trust your intuition. Do it now. <laughs>